We are going to talk about the sales, but before we get there, let's just, um, for our viewers' sake, just uh, give them a perspective of the horse business that you're in, in a nutshell. Thank you, Jackie. Well, I'm a bloodstock broker, if you like. Like a stock broker deals in, in stocks and shares, I deal in bloodstock. Or a house agent sells houses, I sell horses. Right. Um, the horse market is different to the racing market and the, and the betting market. That's the first thing. It stands up as a market on its own. There are 600,000 horses around the world. The auction market around the world is worth about $2.5 billion. And we race in 66 different countries. Different prize money exists in every country, so therefore the values of horses are different in every country. We in South Africa are the eighth largest racing country in the world in terms of our size and stature of the industry. But in terms of average earnings per horse, we're only 22nd. That means that there are 20 odd countries above us where if we change the geographical location of our horse, the horse automatically increases in value and that creates the export market. But what's that based on? If you say we're eighth in the world, what is that based on? Based on the number of horses we have in training and mm -hmm. the size and complexity of our racing. Right. You know, we're not as big as American racing or Australian racing, for example, but our selected horses that go from here, our champions can go and succeed in those countries mm. as they've often done and earn much greater prize money than they can at home. So that effectively creates a trading market. And I think for anybody who wants to get involved in bloodstock, they need to understand the parameters and work out a policy. Mm. You can either do it on a social basis and buy a horse and have some fun, pay 50,000 or 100,000, get a few friends involved and take lucky dip mm. and just hope that the lifestyle experience is more fun than the actual investment that you make. So it's purely a hobby, it's exactly. purely just to have some fun. But what if we want to get serious? How do I know if I want to buy a champion horse? How do I do that? Well, I brought a chart with me, which I think encapsulates uh, the parameters of the market itself and, and the population of all horses. This chart shows that if you want to own a champion or top class or a very good horse, you really need to be buying in the top three or four percent of the population of horses. I always tell my clients who go to the yearling sales that they can take Lucky Dip and pick a number or buy the horse because of the color of its eyes or because that's happened before. Champions have been of course. bought for 60,000. There's so many wonderful but stories in racing which risky. keeps us going because you know, yeah. a man can buy a horse for 1,500 bucks yeah. and end up winning millions of dollars, literally. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, you know, he can go there with a more considered and serious approach, pitch it at the appropriate level and end up buying a, a, a high enough quality of horse that when it comes to the biggest races, the stakes races, that's the top three or four percent of all races, mm. He has a regular horse running in the top races and he, he's in the highest earning capacity with the potential to export overseas. But that's a but horse that's already in training. But yes. what about a yearling? If we're talking about the yearling sales and I yeah. am looking for a potential champion, then what, well, what comes into play? Jackie, if you want a champion, the easiest way to do it is to go and buy an existing champion. But then you have to have a very deep pocket. And I'd just like to illustrate it with a story of a filly called Epitombi. She came from Zimbabwe. She was sold on a lucky dip basis, I suppose, for 1,500 rand equivalent as a yearling. She became the champion filly of Zimbabwe. Her owners decided she was too good for their home country, and they sent her down to South Africa. And she, as a three-year-old, won the Durban July, the first three-year-old filly in 50 years to do something, to do so. So she created history. Mm. Uh, some American clients of mine called Team Valor, who make a policy of buying the best horses around the world, uh, became interested. They said, how much will this filly cost? The answer was 750,000 US dollars. They didn't hesitate. They bought the filly. They took her straight to Dubai. She was never beaten in Dubai. She earned over two million dollars US in prize money. She then went to America. She was never beaten in America. And eventually she went up for auction. She made 1.9 million US dollars at auction. So this filly, which cost the Lucky Dippers, almost nothing, mm -hmm. made them a lot of money. But for Team Valor, who bought at a serious level and bought the champion that already existed, she made them four million US dollars. Mm. So she illustrates both sides of the right. equation. Yeah. Um, if you go to the yearling sales, it's much harder if you have a limited budget and you can get your mates together and buy something relatively cheaply and use your guile, knowledge, experience, propensity for good luck and hope to get a really outstanding horse. Uh, on the other hand, I tell businessmen if you want to take a business approach, you have to play probability theory. You need to buy in the top 10% of the quality in order to get into the top 3%, which is where all the big races lie. Robin, if they're yearlings, they haven't run yet. They haven't raced yet. So how do you know that they are potentially a champion? 
Okay. Would, what are the factors that you th then look at? Do you look then, do you start looking at the bloodline and the history? Yeah, the first thing is you set your policy. If you want to take a serious mm. approach, you set your policy. Do you want a sprinter, do you want a stayer? The fact is that mm. the biggest races are generally over 2,000 meters, yes. the Met, the July, and right. so on. It's easy to buy a sprinter because a sprinter is big and muscular and powerful as a yearling, precocious, is going to run early and come quickly. A staying horse would look more like Bruce Fordyce looked when he was 17 years old, you know, the great comrades marathon runner. You can imagine, as a teenager, he probably was quite gawky. And those horses, you pick on balance and quality and on pedigree. And it takes a judgment and a considered eye to be able to choose them. Um, there's many an uh, expensive horse that's failed completely, so there's always going to be failures. Yeah. The odds are always stacked against it's you, and odds. you need to know that before you start. Mm -hmm. That's why you need to have a proper considered policy before you go in. But once you go in, you're buying quality according to the confirmation of the horse. In confirmation, I call the, the undefinable, I really call it balance, because a racehorse has to run fast, and a big heavy horse, like an elephant, might run rather slow. And I always say that the the only serious fault in a horse is speed. If the horse is slow, he's going to be useless no matter what he looks right. like. You try to buy an athlete, and it's, mm. it's uh, quite tricky to choose. You, in order to aid you, there's various aids. Pedigree is a very good aid. Um, probability theory tells us that if you buy the progeny of a high-class race mare that's won grade one races herself, mm -hmm. you increase the probability of your success by 25 right. times. Right. 25 right. times. Mm -hmm. That's not lucky dip. Mm, mm, in other words, mm. it's an, an analyst's game. It, for me, in buying horses and selecting horses, it's done on the basis of knowledge, information, and experience. Let's and talk you about, hope to get it right. Let's talk about the, the event happening at the end of January and now for the yes. first time in Cape Town. I'm Why very excited about that. Why did you choose that? Cape Town? My business is, is arbitrage and selling and buying horses and ex importing and exporting. But in my spare time, I'm a council member for the Thoroughbred Breeders Association. I have a small stud. I've got 10 mares of my own, and I'm trying to breed my own champions. For those of us involved in breeding, we're very reliant on the sales. And the sales up until now have always been held in Johannesburg mm -hmm. because it said this is where the money is. On the other hand, a large portion of the horses, up, until, up to now around 30% of the horses, get bought by foreign money. And foreign money is all here having holiday in Cape Town in oh, January. Nice. Then, then they go home in February and we're expecting them to fly back in April. It's logistically, this is a much better plan. And on that note, foreign investment, what percentage are you forecasting for, for, these, for the sales happening in January, Robin? The Cape Premier Yearling Sale, it's a bit of a risk for the Thoroughbred Breeders Association because instead of having their own purpose-built complex, they're having to hire the Cape yeah. Town Convention Centre. Um, the promotion around the sale is built on lifestyle because the one thing about horse racing, whether you're doing it as a business or whether you're doing it for the fun. It's a fabulous lifestyle. You rub shoulders with the rich and famous. You have a chance, if you're a small guy, to try and beat the Goliaths of, of business. You know, no one has a monopoly on which the best horse is, so you can pay your money and take your chance, whether it's the, the 1500 buck horse like Ipitombi was, or the two or three million dollar horse which makes the top end of the market. It doesn't matter whether you're the Sheikh or whether you come from Port Elizabeth. Yeah. You, know, you can outdo them. These are the great stories in racing. So this sale, takes place in, the, in, in a lifestyle period yeah. where from the Queen's Plate on the 8th of January mm -hmm. through to the Met on the 29th of January, Cape Town is awash with parties and glamour and fun and pretty girls and lifestyle and every single lifestyle day. And it's a lifestyle that you buy into, isn't it, exactly. Robin? Exactly. And then well, you get to that sale and you've now got to pitch yourself against the biggest buyers with the most experience. And now it's, it's your brain and it's your luck to see if you can outrun them, outgun them and outsucceed them. You know, it's like a game of survival. Sounds very exciting. So, and an exciting we're going to be there. We will all be there. And we're going to be there. Robin, we'll see you there. Thank you so much for joining us on Bloodline today. Thank you very much, Jackie. Thank I'd you. just like to say, I think the average price in that sale would be maybe 350,000 Rand, and the top price will make uh, three to four million.